Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. We're recording this podcast on October the 19th, 2020. The race to COVID-19 vaccines and treatments continues with multiple clinical trials being in the end stages of testing. While research is moving at a rapid pace, it's not without challenges. In fact, last week, two clinical trials were placed on hold or paused due to safety concerns. One of our favorite experts is here to talk with us today. Dr. Greg Poland returns. He's a virologist, vaccine expert, and infectious disease specialist at the Mayo Clinic. And it's wonderful to have you back today, Greg. Thank you, Helena. Lots to talk about in the news. All right, let's get started. Well, I mentioned earlier that um, there have been a couple more clinical trials halted last week. And what can you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, the Johnson & Johnson phase three vaccine trial was halted, um, and the Eli Lilly uh, monoclonal antibody trial, also a phase three trial, was halted. Now, a a couple of uh, subtle distinctions. Vaccine trials, it's not uncommon that there be a halt. We're giving vaccines to healthy people, and in this case, we're using novel vaccine platforms. So any unexpected side effect is gonna pause the trial. It's a little different in a monoclonal antibody or drug trial. In this case, these are people hospitalized ill with the disease. And the reason for the pause, and we don't have a lot of details, the reason for the pause is that in the group that was treated versus the group that did not receive the monoclonal antibody, after five days, there was concern that clinically the treated group was not doing as well, raising the specter that the monoclonal antibody could potentially be harmful. And so it was appropriate to pause, but two different kinds of reasoning behind the pause. Another uh, study that was being done is on remdesivir, and the World Health Organization has released some information about uh, the study that's been ongoing there. What can you tell us about that? Well, this is really an interesting one, and I would say a difficult one for the field. So this was the WHO solidarity trial over almost 11,300 subjects involving a little over 400 hospitals in 30 countries. So this is a big trial. And they tested remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, beta interferon, and a combination antiviral that's actually used in HIV treatment called Kalitra. And what they found is none of them offered any benefit. Now this is interesting. This is the biggest trial done to date. It is a randomized trial. And as I say, uh, uh, good investigators across 30 different countries. As you know, the NIH had done one trial, a much smaller trial, showing that recovery time was shortened and the time to clinical improvement shortened in a small study of remdesivir, but no mortality benefit. There were two smaller trials done in China that were basically the same thing. The largest of the two showed clinical improvement with a five-day regimen, but interestingly enough, not with a 10-day regimen. So we're really left sort of scratching our heads over this one to say, interesting, the, the best trial, the largest trial uh, that was randomized did not show any benefit. Small, uh, two smaller trials have shown indicators, I would call them soft indicators of benefit. All of this suggests to me that remdesivir is likely to have a, at best, small benefit. That's all we can, can conclude at this point, or potentially no benefit. So I think further work is being done, and uh, there'll be more thinking about and commentary over the uh, trial. I I should say that the WHO solidarity trial was uh, mounted this week, this past week, on a preprint server. So I've been through that uh, literature, but it has not yet been peer-reviewed. So uh, more uh, data may come out of this yet. We'd heard so much talk about remdesivir. I guess it's a little bit disappointing that we haven't seen more benefit from it. Were you surprised that it did not uh, improve the death rate for COVID? You know, it it hasn't uh, all along in in any of the trials. And that's why I say 
it's, it's probably offering small benefit. Now, having said that, there's one proviso. With viral infections, the earlier in the course that you treat, the better. This is a five to 10 day IV regimen. So it's not something easy to do on an outpatient basis. It's expensive. Um, there's not you know, an abundant supply of it. So these have, been, these have been trials done in the sicker patients. And it's quite possible that one of the reasons we're not seeing uh, a mortality benefit is they're already sick by the time we start. In other words, we're trying to put the fire out once the fire has gone on for days uh, or a week or longer. It's possible, particularly if this could be in an oral formulation, that maybe we would see benefit if we started early on. For example, um, with influenza infections, we start antivirals within 48 hours of any symptoms, and it's, and it's quite effective. I've had the interesting experience of having multiple relatives and friends, actually, and then relatives of some of my friends who have not wanted to go get tested for COVID. They've, they've had an illness that could be COVID and said, well, why don't I just stay at home and you know, I don't have to really go out anyway, so I'm not gonna go get tested. How important is it to get tested if you suspect that you may have COVID? And then how important is it to share the positive uh, test results with your um, healthcare provider and why? This one's easy, very important. <laughs> and, the, and the reason for that is several fold. Some that have to do with the individual and some that have to do with the, the community or population. Number one, knowing that you actually are infected means a whole series of moderately disruptive changes in your pattern of living, and you're, particularly if you live with somebody else, right? So we're gonna wanna protect them. We're gonna uh, ask you not to go to work. We're gonna ask who your contacts are, and we don't reveal your name, but then do contact tracing and try to limit the spread of this. People don't realize that they actually are infectious, even though they don't feel poorly. So that's important. The second thing is it's important for monitoring your own health. What happens if two days later you have um, a new symptom? Are you going to brush that symptom off? Because, of course, a layperson may not realize this is a consequence of actually having COVID infection. And the earlier we intervene, particularly particularly in an older person, somebody who has comorbidities, the greater the opportunity to prevent sometimes disabling consequences of the infection and death. So it's really important that we know. The other community level uh, uh, issue is the more we know about spread in the community, the better you can make public policy. When do you open schools? When do you open businesses and restaurants? When do you sound the all clear for going back to work? That heavily, heavily depends on the burden of infection in that community. And if people don't show up, you, you don't know what it is. All you know is the extreme end, the people who get sick enough to end up in the hospital. Well, much of what we hear is either preventative, we're looking for vaccines, or it's treatment for patients who are fairly far along and quite ill and hospitalized. Are there treatment or therapies available to patients who don't require hospitalization? Well, you know, certainly some of the things that are being tried now are monoclonal and other anti antiviral therapies at the outpatient basis. Um, no reason you couldn't potentially move convalescent sera out to the outpatient um, side. But beyond that, there are no home remedies. There are no other drugs that we're aware of. Uh, that you can do that's somehow going to cure you of, of SARS-CoV-2 or change the course of that disease. We're hearing more about reinfection as well. So people who've already had COVID and been um, diagnosed and then um, have, are infected again. Right. Do you think we're going to see more of that as time progresses? Yeah, you know, we have, uh, I think, at least five now well-documented uh, cases of this. There may be a few more than that. In two of them, uh, the second episode of disease was actually worse. One wasn't too unexpected. It was an elderly woman with a, a bone marrow uh, issue. 
Um, but the other was a younger man who had more serious disease the second time. I think now that it's documented, we're probably going to look for it more often and I think find it. The issue will be, what is that duration? We already know that antibodies wane over time, but it will be different based on age and a variety of other medical issues that somebody might have. Um, so we see waning of antibodies as soon as 80 days after infection, and we see antibodies present as long as years afterwards, at least in the case of SARS. Now, we don't have years experience yet with SARS-CoV-2, but I think the same thing is going to hold. Some people will become susceptible uh, very quickly, other people perhaps not for years, and uh, that's an area of active inquiry to try to understand that. But yes, I think we're going to be looking for reinfection more frequently now that we know it occurs. Well, speaking of vaccines, Greg, I know that you had your flu vaccine last week, and I went down and had mine uh, in the employee cafeteria here at Mayo Clinic uh, this morning. I've had many people ask me, well, is it really important to get a flu vaccine? And if I get a flu vaccine, will it make the, any vaccine that comes out for COVID-19 um, less effective because I've already had this flu vaccine this fall. What do you think about that? Yeah, of- so I think what they're, they're asking about is a phenomena called uh, viral interference. The idea that if you have two viruses or two vaccines, do you in some way interfere with the immune response? We have no evidence of that. Something could change, of course, once it's used across hundreds of thousands and millions of people, but at this point, we have no evidence of that. What we do have evidence of is that influenza alone, and it can be unpredictable, sickens tens of millions of people in the US every year, hospitalizes hundreds of thousands, and kills tens of thousands. The other thing we know from two studies that have studied uh, well over 100,000 people is that simultaneous infection with COVID and influenza doubled the death rate. So getting your flu vaccine is important on multiple levels. It appears to lower, not increase, the uh, mortality experience of people who get simultaneously infected. It decreases symptomatology. It decreases the surge demand on the medical system. It decreases the anxiety somebody's naturally going to have in the midst of a pandemic over what do these respiratory symptoms represent for me? And while they're waiting to get a COVID test back, which might be several days, they're in isolation. They can't go to work. They're separated from their family members. So the easiest thing in the world to do is take influenza off the table by as many of us as possible getting a flu vaccine. I get it every year. Every member of my family gets it. This is an important, safe, and effective thing we can all do. Does the type of blood group that you have have any effect on your experience with COVID-19? This is a really interesting question. And in fact, it's an interesting question in the field of infectious disease because it's been asked about pneumococcal disease and other infections. And I follow this story closely because I'm blood group A. (laughs) This is the group purported to do the worst. So what happened is just a few days ago, a large study was released out of Denmark showing that people with blood group O had a decreased risk of getting infected by COVID by about 13%. So at a population level, that's a a really uh, big difference. They did not find an increased risk for hospitalization or death by any blood group in in this study. Now, they had some problems in that about 38% of this huge cohort they looked at, they didn't actually have blood group on. So, you know, we have to take that uh, with a a tincture of salt. There was also a study done out of uh, Vancouver, out of British Columbia, showing that type A and type AB actually had an increased risk for mechanical ventilation if they got COVID and an increased risk for continuous renal replacement therapy, as well as an increased risk for prolonged ICU admission. So, you know, in total, we have, I think now three studies suggesting that people with blood group A do poorer 
and people with blood group O do better. You have a fun little story that you told us about your son when he was little and had to get a flu vaccine. Would you mind telling that to our listeners? <laughs> well, my, uh, my precocious, uh, I think he was four or five year old at the time, they always got nervous right around fall time uh, when my wife would pick them up from school if, if she drove anywhere near the clinic because they knew what was coming. Um, and he said to me through tears, he said, because he, he knew I worked in va developing vaccines. So this is a four-year-old's conception. He said, Daddy, how come you couldn't work at a chocolate factory instead of a shot factory? <laughs> <laughs> That is wonderful, Greg. Out of the mouths of babes. <laughs> we got some chocolate for having that flu yeah, shot. He was a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being with us again, Greg. Thank you to you too for joining us on Mayo Clinic Q&A today. I hope that you learned something along with me today. And uh, we thank Greg Poland for being with us again. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org, then click on podcasts. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu. Thanks for listening and be well.